morning, our lesson is on how Jesus handled sinners and his, how did he treat them? We can look going back, back into the Old Testament, and we can see how God has always treated sinners, always. We can see the, uh, actually the mercy given to Cain, going back to Cain. There's mercy also given to Adam and Eve, but let's talk about Cain for right now. Cain, well, he could have, God could have killed Cain immediately, and it was his prerogative to do so. Of course, it's his prerogative to take, I'm talking about God's prerogative to take any life that he wants to. It's simply him calling them into account, calling them into judgment, calling that this is the end of your life and time has run out. But he shows a mercy to Cain. We can see also prophet after prophet concerning Israel how, and how many of them. You have someone like Moses giving warnings concerning what would happen if Israel left Jehovah and, of course, there were times when, uh, even in Moses' life, they did and would return. But how many prophets were there that had something to say? They are warnings to Israel or even to other nations. Warnings that are given, and it was always with either the expressed purpose or implied purpose of repentance. It all had that. Every bit of it had that implied in the message or just in, in so many words that all they had to do was return to God. And even just this morning we talked briefly concerning that of Jonah and Nineveh. And Nineveh, if God would allow Nineveh to repent, He'd allow anybody to repent. He would lie. If he will do it for Nineveh, he will do it for anybody. And, and let's face it, if he would do it for Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, he'll do it for anybody. With those who crucified Christ and with those who plotted his death, those that were in the crowd while they did not physically touch him, they were shouting out, crucify him, showing an extraordinary cowardice in my opinion. I don't, can't answer for all of them, but I think in my opinion, just the, they're afraid of what men would do to them and following along with, with their leaders. But let's look in John chapter 8 first off. John chapter 8. And we're going to look just in the, the Christ here upon the earth and how he treated, how he treated sinners. In John chapter 8, and beginning in verse 3, then the scribes and the Pharisees, notice, scribes and the Pharisees, scribes and the Pharisees have not been any, as a whole, they were two different sects of the Jews. They were loyal to their own doctrines, not to the law of Moses, but to their own doctrines. They had made their own twists one way or another. Uh, 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 in, in those doctrines, and as a whole, they rejected Christ. That's why they're working together in this. Scribes and the Pharisees, their own doctrines contradicted each other. But, you know, as it is often said, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well, the enemy of my enemy happens to be the Pharisees, or it happens to be the, the Sadducees, and so they join together and go against Christ. But, all of this being done is not out of justice. They're not concerned one bit with justice. And they're not concerned one bit with the woman that they're going to bring here. They're not concerned what they have no love for any individual and certainly have no loyalty to Christ at all. But we see, then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst... They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now, here is the conundrum. Here is, they're bringing this out once again, not because they cared anything about the justice of it. Because if there were going to be any justice be done, this wasn't the way it was to be done. What they're doing is not what was to be done. But 
They want to put Christ into some kind of conundrum, some kind of position where He's going to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or bend under some kind of immense pressure of He is on the spot. And they've done it. They have put Him on the spot. But you don't play games with God because God's going to show you. You don't play games with the Christ in these things because you're going to walk away the loser every single time. Every time. Because you're not going to play these kinds of games. Now Moses, verse 5, Now Moses in the law commanded us that, uh, that such should be stoned. But what do you say? And this is not exactly an honest question. They, they didn't want to know what he had to say so that they could follow it. They wanted him to embarrass himself or they wanted him to contradict something. They wanted something other than what they got because what they got, they could not have predicted. They could not have predicted. And I tell you what, there's nothing that uh, can, can blind someone so much as arrogance. Someone, well, I suppose there, there could be, but, but arrogance goes a long way in blinding people and thinking that they have got, they have got this, that uh, they're going to show, they're going to show Christ a thing or two. They're going to outwit him. They're going to outsmart him. They're going to outpolitic him. And he's not a political creature whatsoever. He doesn't care what the rulers think. He doesn't care what Rome thinks. He doesn't care about those things as far as bending to their pressure and pleasing them. He's there to please the Father. Not any man, but the Father only. That's it. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. So this wasn't honest. This was only to put something, out, some bait with a hook. And here he is publicly, some bait with a hook of now we've got, as we might say, a sound bite. We've got something we can use against him. Something of which they could accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So he's, it looks like he's just ignoring, ignoring them. And yes, we do not know what he wrote. And nor am I going to speculate. I haven't the foggiest idea what he wrote on, in the ground. As though he did not hear. Is this anything significant to them, what he wrote? I don't know. <laughs> I can't answer that question. I don't know. Verse 7, So when they continued asking him, he raised up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Did he just contradict Moses? No, he didn't. He didn't contradict Moses. Nor was he going to be drug into this as though he were to be the judge in this because he's not the judge yet. He's not a, to be the, the just like with the, the man who said, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. And Christ responded, who made me a judge over you? Who made me the arbiter over you? Who made me, who put me into this situation? Nobody and, and don't do it. Nobody. And, and so he, and he had a lesson for, for that man. But here is, okay, he who's without sin among you, that's quite a statement. Let him cast the first stone. And of course, the response to that, and they're not going to say it, the response to that is, uh, yeah, I don't know who that would be. Or I'm not about to say, I'm that one. I'm not about to say that. And uh, they, and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. That's verse 8, now verse 9. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience 
went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? No one has thrown a stone yet? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, he doesn't say she didn't sin. He doesn't say that, nor does he say that the things that she did somehow were okay. He doesn't say that either, but he tells her, go and sin no more. Now, there could be nothing wrong, and of course, if the Pharisees and Sadducees could have figured out anything wrong with what he said, they would have broadcast it. They would have made sure that everybody knew about it. They're not about to go broadcast this. They're not about to. And, and what did he say, by the way? He said, the, whoever has, is without sin cast the first stone. So I take it you did not pick up a stone. And, well, no, no, I, I guess I didn't. <laughs> okay. Well, there's nothing one could say against it. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. All right, he's just told her to sin no more. Her accusers have gone, and really they didn't care anything about stoning her. They didn't care anything about that. Matter of fact, I have a feeling in their mind that there would have been no stoning at all. I think in their mind they weren't prepared, obviously they were not prepared for that answer, but they did not expect this to be said by him, that they would, he would have tried to soften things up, try to, to uh, distance a little bit away from what Moses said, which would have put him into, well, uh, that, that's a, a fickle person, that's, that's a weak person, that's someone not following the law of Moses. Because he doesn't say Moses was wrong, because Moses wasn't wrong. Nor was their interpretation wrong, because that wasn't wrong either. Their interpretation was right. But what they were trying to do was wrong. And what they were trying to do was wrong, because all it was is try to trap him. That's all it was. Justice, they didn't care a thing about it. They, they, who knows? Uh, uh, who this, who who they they brought in here, and and who the, you know what who those men were, and what sins they may have had in their life. Who knows? But they all they want to do is try to trap Jesus. Now let's go to Luke chapter seven. In Luke chapter seven, we have just a, a simple statement. And well, let's get there first. Luke chapter seven. And in beginning in verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster, alabaster flask of fragrant oil. Now, she wasn't invited. Because the Pharisee, I don't think the Pharisee would have invited her, not with the response that he has. She's not invited, but she comes there. She arrives there because she's going to do something. She knows that her Creator is on this earth. She knows that her Savior is on this earth, and she knows who it is. She knows who it is that will forgive her of her sins and has forgiven her of her sins. She knows who, he, who is capable of doing that. In her mind, she already has full faith in who Jesus is. She already has full faith. Now, the Pharisee doesn't. The Pharisee is doing something that other Pharisees would not do, but he's doing it. But he doesn't seem to be doing it with a, an ulterior motive. He doesn't appear to be doing that. But here comes in this woman, and she brings this fragrant oil in an alabaster flask. Now, being that it's in this container means 
automatically it means this is an expensive item. This is expensive because something that would have been less expensive would not have been in something like this. It would have been in like a just a, a simple clay jar or a simple little vial or something like that. That uh, there were millions made in those days. There would have been things like this, but this is something special, very, very special. And stood, that's her, stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, now he doesn't, he doesn't utter this out loud. He spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. So the Pharisee knows who it is. So does Jesus. Jesus does too. Now the Pharisee, as we already looked at just this morning, uh, with the Pharisees, uh, well, with there in, in Matthew chapter 7, you have Jesus going to the office of Matthew, to a tax collector, follow me, Matthew does, and there is a dinner. And it obviously is at Matthew's house. If it's not at his house, it, there, there's a lot of tax collectors there, a lot of, quote, sinners who are there. And it's the Pharisees who go to Christ, to Jesus' disciples and say, why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why does he do that? Now he does answer that, you know, it's the sick who need a physician. And someone who is well doesn't need a physician. Where did you expect the good physician to be? Where did you think he was going to be? Is not the shepherd, and we change this, is not the shepherd interested in all of the sheep, not just the 99 of which they would have counted themselves, not just the 99, but there's that one that left. Is the shepherd not interested also in that one? Well, the good shepherd is. The good shepherd is interested in all the sheep and not just those who have uh, dressed the part of righteousness or have made themselves into the, the, the super righteous. Not that God made them that way. Uh, they have they made themselves, the thinking themselves that way, and put themselves, as we would say, on a high horse and looked down on everybody. And there were some folks of which tax collectors and, and the sinners would be low, low in the strata of humanity. They would be extremely low. Down there would also be the Samaritans, and down there would also be all the Romans. They, they, they would see everybody else as low. And if a prophet, a real prophet, or if the real Christ were on the earth, he would have nothing to do with that lot. Well, since when did they not read their Old Testament and learn anything. I see a Rahab being brought into the line of Christ. I see someone like a Ruth also being brought, coming from a pagan background, brought into the line of Christ. We see others that of nations, also already mentioned Nineveh, but they're not the only nation. Nations in, that were doing their own ways, sinking deep into, into corruption, deep into immoral behavior, wickedness, and God even have a message for them. And what about when Israel was taking a nosedive morally? to where they get to a point where they're sacrificing their children. And the children are dying. They're killing their own children in the worship of Molech. And what about Judah? Judah also just on a slower dive, so it would appear, because every now and then they would have a righteous king. 
but on a slower nosedive and doing, go, taking that same route. Did God not show mercy and long-suffering toward them? Well, He did. He showed a long-suffering to them. Even when, as He describes it, their hands are full of blood. There's just bloodshed in the street. It is violence upon violence. Blood touching blood. Now, let's continue with this. All right? So the Pharisee says, look, if he was, if he was a prophet, really a prophet, he wouldn't have anything to do with her. Well, how did you come to that conclusion? How did you come to that conclusion? Verse 40, And Jesus answered and said to him. So Jesus knows precisely what he's thinking. Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? So one owes 500 and the other owns really a tenth of that, just 50. But it didn't matter that neither one had anything in which to pay him. They couldn't pay the debt, couldn't even begin to pay the debt. And so he forgives them both. And so the question is, which one will love him more? And the Pharisee, Simon, answers it correctly. Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. That is correct. Now, this is what he says. Look, then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, to you, her sins, which are many, he doesn't deny that, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. He had that right to do that. He had that right. And he is showing by how the Pharisee, the Pharisee didn't mistreat Jesus. He's invited him to supper. And uh, it, would, it doesn't appear like there was some kind of, of wicked intent by it. There's nothing, nothing that he's done necessarily wrong, but he's showing here is this person who you look down on showing me greater respect than you and showing a greater love than you because she knows she has sins. That's why she's here. She knows her sins are many. That's why she's here. This is remorse, but it's also repentance. And it's also recognizing the Redeemer. That's precisely what it is. And recognizing the one who can resolve her everything. Resolve everything for her. No doubt she has a life that is just wreckage. And it's her own doing. No doubt about that. And that uh, the, the, her, her life has been made into the condition that, that she put it. Now here's someone that can take her sins away, and she knows it. And here is this Pharisee who, you know, I can think we can safely say uh, was never a prostitute on the street. This Pharisee who we can safely say has certainly studied Moses and the prophets. Here is this, this man who uh, is, is uh, more knowledgeable perhaps than, than this woman. But she had a greater love for Christ. And she humbled herself. She humbled herself in knowing that here is my Savior and I need Him. No one else can solve this. No one. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 18. 
Matthew 18. And we'll begin in verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. I, I didn't read that right. Up to seven times? Question mark. Which, uh, in uh, Peter's way of thinking, and with that, that way of uh, the word seven means complete, total, but Jesus is going to show this as being more than just that, and in, in a greater emphasis, I should say, putting a greater emphasis in that. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven, which amps it up. Always, always forgive. The one who asks for forgiveness, always forgive that person, always. And he ties it up. Let's, let's just go briefly to Matthew chapter 6. We'll come back, we'll come back where we are in, in chapter 18. But Matthew chapter 6, and here in the model, model prayer, verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. God will not forgive us unless we're willing to forgive those who sinned against us. And he's going to reiterate that. He's going to bring it out again, verse 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That is all conditional. That is conditional. And we talk about you know, the, the, the fact that, that it is, for whoever thinks it's faith only, they either have a twisted view of what that means because what it means is literally you don't have to do anything but believe in God but in just in the words of Christ just in the words of Christ we could see where there are more things that must be done beyond just believing him is the entry point believing in him is the first step that's the first but forgiveness being willing to forgive others is imperative because God takes a very harsh view, an extremely harsh view on those He's willing to forgive who do not want to forgive those who've sinned against them. Of, and there is that parable. And here we have, actually, we, we have that now, verse 23, therefore, so we're back in Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay his master, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children, all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. All right, here is someone who pleads, pleads, and here is a merciful king, a merciful king. He owes all this money, 10,000 talents. That's a lot. 10,000 talents. I will pay you everything just right now. I can't have mercy and patience with me. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him his debt. He doesn't expect him to do anything anymore. You don't have to pay this. It's forgiven. It's done. Okay. You can go home and all is well. No one is sold and the debt is forgiven. Everything. All right. Now there was, this is Christ's attitude toward us. He's the king and he's willing to forgive everything. As we said, if he's willing to forgive those who crucified him, which... Clearly, they would have been in Jerusalem uh, on the, the day of Pentecost. That's only 50 days after the crucifixion. At least most of them would have been there. At least of the Jews, they would have been there. And probably Roman soldiers who had been there 50 days earlier, they're there too. And they would have had the same opportunity 
to obey the gospel, but he forgives that debt. But, but we're not through with this parable yet. Verse 28, Then that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So this fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not. He went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. Okay, what is owed here is nothing. A hundred denarii is nothing like what was owed. Ten thousand talents? A hundred denarii is nothing compared to ten thousand talents. There's no comparison. There's a huge difference that this particular unforgiving servant owed a lot more than what was owed to him. Verse 31, so when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? He has, he has pity on all of us. He has compassion for all of us. And we are to show that same compassion. We're to show that same pity. There, and, and you know, folks, folks can, can rejoice that He will forgive them of their sins. But there's also in that a willingness to forgive others who have sinned against you. There must be that willingness. If, you, if we want Christ to forgive us, we have to be willing then to forgive others. Our fellow servants, forgive them. Verse 34, And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. All right, the truth of the matter is he couldn't have paid the debt even outside of the torturers. He couldn't have paid that debt ever. That's too high of a debt. That's too much. He couldn't have done it. For the rest of his life he could not have done it because that's a, he's, he's just a servant. He doesn't make enough. He doesn't have enough resources to do this. Now his resources are zero. He can't pay the debt any more than, than the, the one he threw into prison. How's he going to get the money in prison? He was having a hard time while he was working. Now how's he going to get the money? Well, he can't. Verse 35, conclusion. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Here is how does Christ treat sinners? He treats us all, us all with compassion, with the expectation of full obedience. And part of that full obedience is being willing to treat others in the same fashion, with the same compassion, with all of that. Because He is willing to do that for us and wants us to change, wants us to be more holy and following the ways of righteousness, which the ways of righteousness are not Phariseeism. And looking down on others, thinking yourself, well, it's the, the, the self-righteous approach, uh, Christ does not bring us to that. Christ does not bring anyone to self-righteousness, to thinking that we're better than anybody else. We're not. Not better than anybody at all. I am just willing to follow Christ. That's it. And outside of that, I'm nothing. Outside of that, I don't have anything. If I did not have Christ, I don't know what I would be today. I have no idea, but condemned. But Christ, you know, the teaching of Christ has had a profound effect on human history. 
I speak of this briefly every now and then. One of these days, maybe, I don't know, we might, we might have a short series, not in sermons, but in, they'd need to be classes, on the effect, clearly the effect that Christ has had on this world and the world doesn't even know it or has denied it or just suppressed that and just not taught anymore. There's been a profound effect that that occurred because of the teaching of Christ. And just, I speak of this every now and then, of, of maybe reading someone who may just be a rank atheist or just a, a consider themselves irreligious and the, the principles that they're saying, or they may even make a direct quote of Christ. And I wonder, did they realize that they just quoted someone they dislike? Did they realize they just quoted Christ and that that is a principle that Christ gives? That, that, that's a direct quote from like the Sermon on the Mount or one of his parables. They, they, just, they just did that. Do they realize what they did? All the while uh, trying to, to say, that to, to come to a different conclusion <laughs> that then uh, Jesus is the Christ and we should be obedient to him. But Christ wants us to treat each other like he treats us. And he expects it. And there is harsh punishment for not being willing to do it. So there is the rejoicing, the rejoicing of, yes, Christ does take that good physician, the great physician, he does take in patience. But he expects those patients to become like him in character and being willing to help each other. That we help each other and we don't become like so many others of, of uh, self-satisfied or, or uh, that uh, uh, somehow that we are better than anybody else and nobody is. We're all the same. Nobody is better than anybody else. It's just some have chosen to follow Christ and others have yet to do so. We ask this evening that we look at our own lives, look at where we are at this moment spiritually and take an honest look, at an honest jury to it. And if we're not exactly sure, maybe we need to do more study, more reading, more examining, more self-examination, and look, and then come to the proper conclusions, and let Christ make the next part of our growth, the next thing that we need to do in growing closer to Him and the Father, growing closer to God, the entire Godhead, and doing what we have been called to do. This evening, if you need to respond to the invitation, if you need the prayers of the congregation, if we can help you in any way, we ask that you come as we stand and sing.